Hello, everyone, and welcome to On the Safe Side, a monthly podcast hosted by the editors of Safety and Health Magazine, the official magazine of the National Safety Council. This is Barry Botino, an associate editor with Safety and Health, and with me are my colleagues and fellow associate editors, Alan Ferguson and Kevin Drewley. This is our April 2022 episode, number 26 in the history of this podcast. Wherever and however you're listening to us today, we thank you so much for spending some time with us. We know that many of you have had a unique journey into the safety profession, and we want to hear about it for our My Story feature in the magazine. We invite you and your colleagues to submit your personal stories of how you got into the safety field by emailing us at safehealth at nsc.org. You can also view past My Story entries and catch up on other news from around the safety world on our website at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. In this month's episode of the podcast, Kevin will take us on a deep dive into his feature story on language barriers in the workplace. Kevin will discuss the need for clear, written, and verbal communications, especially when different languages are involved. We also will be joined by Jessica Bunting, the Director of Research to Practice at CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. Jessica will be discussing the National Safety Stand Down to Prevent Falls in Construction, which is planned for May 2nd through May 6th. Is everybody ready? Let's get this episode rolling. Each month here at On the Safe Side, we take a look at a feature story from the latest issue of Safety and Health Magazine, which we call our Deep Dive segment. In the April issue, Kevin looks at how organizations and safety pros can ensure they're communicating needed information to employees in a language they understand. That includes both spoken and written words, such as training materials or signage, Kevin, thank you so much for your work on this feature story. Now, will you please grab your fins and mask and take us into the deep blue waters? Absolutely, Alan, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, Full disclosure, I awkwardly lost my goggles upon hitting the water during my most recent and only snorkeling excursion eight years ago, but we still should be all right, I think. If there is a next time, I'm definitely going to use the ladder and back of the boat instead of the platform. For this story, though, uh, multiple experienced safety professionals and academics shared their perspectives and strategies for addressing language barriers and safety, which we've discussed just in introducing this segment today. That includes written and spoken methods of communication and and signage and instruction and things along those lines. Just would seem to be a certainty that many of those listening today can think of at least one example in which they witness language barriers at play in the workplace, because as we know, we live in a world with an increasingly diverse workforce. The data bears that out. Uh, Data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics show that foreign-born workers comprise 17% of the U.S. workforce in 2020, up from about 14% in 2003. However, 22.5% of all workplace fatalities in 2020 involved Hispanic or Latino workers. In the meantime, OSHA requires that employers do provide training in a language and vocabulary that workers can understand, but that may not always be a reality which again is suggested by data. Looking at the construction industry in a 2018 study, NIOSH and the American Society of Safety Engineers, now the American Society of Safety Professionals, found that immigrant construction workers in companies with fewer than 50 employees received less initial and ongoing training than their counterparts in companies with 50 or more employees. Additionally, supervisors spoke the same language as immigrant workers at 68.9% of the larger construction companies compared with 37.5% of the smaller companies. One of the sources we spoke with for the story, Tom Cunningham, he was lead study author and as a behavioral scientist at NIOSH said, quote, we haven't seen anything to suggest that has shifted since then and in the four years since the study was released. This, of course, is an issue because as, as Tom and, and many who spoke with us for the story said in so many words, people need to fully understand what their duties and expectations are in order to fulfill them safely. It's just a key element of communicating. Kevin, backtracking to the OSHA requirement that you mentioned, what are some takeaways for employers to ensure that a worker truly grasps and understands the training? Good question. Um, Really, a starting point stems from a conversation with two members of United Steelworkers, uh, Steve Salmon, who's director of USW's Environmental Health and Safety Department, and also Juan Zuniga, a worker trainer in the EHS Department of USW who is fluent in English and Spanish. You'll see, or if you have seen as you read the story, Juan kind of is part of the introduction and really has a steady voice throughout just because of his diverse background and and his job duties. Regarding training, Steve said, though, that employers cannot assume workers are trained because they have someone's signature on an attendance sheet. 
And to that, Juan added that you want to have a trainer or facilitator who knows the audience they're speaking to. And that doesn't necessarily just mean they're a cohort or someone in, in the same field in which they're training. In training scenarios, there has to be that two-way communication, Juan said. So it can't just be someone telling an audience, quote, here are the rules, follow them, unquote. You have to have that ongoing, engaging conversation to help the worker participate and feel invested in what he or she is learning. And that might sound to some listening like things we've discussed in the past with public speaking or storytelling, but when you have different languages coming into play, that adds just an additional consideration. As we know, just anecdotally, observationally, whether we're in the workplace or just out doing whatever, these different languages have different dialects. And when the workforce includes multiple individuals with different cultural perspectives, again, we've you know, got to bring those things in, into play. The employer level for these companies that may not have workers with bilingual capabilities in-house and you're wishing to convey training, um, you know, either a spoken message or signage to someone within that training, uh, the experts who spoke to us for the story suggested contacting networks and trade associations for any relevant resources, maybe to, to build a, a little bit more of an awareness or a strategy for that. Um, as far as some of these more direct, immediate communications go, companies may also choose to contract a translation service. I know had uh, spoken with a couple folks who had provided, for instances, with that. Um, though on, on the other side there, with translation, um, another important note, especially if you're looking to do that within your organization and not contract it out, many people said stay away from the search engine. Uh, there was a lot of discussion of, of difficulties with simply plugging in a, a phrase or an entire training module or an infographic text, for instance, uh, into, for, you know, for example, a Google translator, and then finding that much of the message was not being conveyed the way it's supposed to. It wasn't just simple plug and play. Vanessa Galvin, who's a veteran safety professional and part of ASSP's Hispanic Safety Professionals Advisory Committee, shared one of those anecdotes, and some are in the story and some are in the podcast, but she had mentioned that the Spanish translation for the very word safety, and my apologies, I, I took high school French and my dialect there isn't great, so we'll see what Spanish is, but the, the Spanish translation for safety, la seguridad, that more accurately held connotations to the idea of security or a security guard, and she also gave a similar example for the idea of machine guarding. It was almost this person who stood sentry in front of a machine rather than what we know in the safety field for that to be. So just really knowing those things are there and paying attention to them and being sure that the person con conveying the training um, is cognizant of that as well. So really with, with that in mind, in, in one way, and another widespread suggestion that people shared about training a multicultural workforce is really just to have that worker demonstrate a skill to mastery. And, and that can certainly apply for someone who is English speaking or someone who is Spanish speaking or French or whatever the language may be. So whatever this training is covering, that maybe that's putting on a safety harness or setting up a fall barrier, but whatever the case, ask them again to, to display what they're being asked to do. And if things shouldn't go well, that will at least give the employer, you know, the frame of reference and the idea that they now need to begin to figure out whether this shortcoming on the worker's part is related to a language barrier or the material itself. So, Kevin, what are some other examples of concrete things employers can do to address language barriers? Well, kind of as with training, there are some short-term and some long-term solutions and ideas. Um, in the short term, kind of dovetails with some things that we've talked about uh, to this point, just really emphasizing and making sure that the person who is delivering the message or the job instruction or the training to an audience that, you know, speaks another language, that this person doing doing that speaking fully understands the message. It can't just be as immediate as an employer taking a bilingual worker aside and asking him or her to tell a group of non-English speakers, hey, could you tell so-and-so something in your language? Uh, you have, to, again, to be cognizant of what, what that is and, you know, again, be, being wary of these false translations and just really understanding and ideally being someone who has performed this job task many times over uh, himself or herself. 
So as an offshoot of that, one source had offered the suggestion of implementing a sort of quote unquote visual language in the workplace. And to her, this would involve developing pictogram images or infographics that would convey specific information about a hazard or risk. And that would act as sort of a universal application for workers who may speak different languages. She uh, had compared this to the pictogram seen within OSHA's hazard communication standard, that's 1910-1200, in which symbols and graphic elements such as colors or borders represent various information about chemical hazards. So that was just a suggestion for this, you know, kind of an immediate way to solve language barriers, issues if, if you feel they exist. And, you know, again, related to that, she suggested that the uh, the hazard assessment really could be one immediate spot where it's very apparent whether or not a language barrier exists just by the very nature of what the hazard assessment is. You, you really get that clear picture of what's at play and what the what the worker should be cognizant of as, as work begins. Uh, moving sort of to kind of the, the ideological ideas or, or long-term ideas, um, one of those came from Michael Flynn, and he coordinates the Occupational Health Equity Program at NIOSH, and he discussed uh, an encouraging movement that has started to see employers begin to offer basic language classes to workers, and uh, those typically focus on those who don't speak English. Um, however, Flynn did say that employers often promote this as a way of, quote-unquote, getting ahead of the curve and adapting to the changing world and the, the, the multicultural uh, and multilingual workforce that we've been discussing. Anecdotally, though, Flynn said that it's been reported that sometimes um, this focus on, on the non-English speaking workers might create some resentment with the U.S. born workers. He said there have been anecdotal observations of that, and uh, these workers may view the classes as special treatment. So one way around this, but also a way to really fully develop the entire workforce was that Flynn said uh, some employers who have the Spanish speaking workers uh, taking English classes, they also are offering Spanish classes for English-speaking workers. Uh, and, and he said, quote, and so that way, regardless of what your first language is, you have the ability to learn a second language or at least become proficient or functional in that language for the work site, um, unquote. So it's, you know, again, it's not necessarily learning everything there is to know and getting to a Spanish four level in, in a matter of a couple weeks, but you're you're learning what is necessary to know when you're communicating, you're, you're learning the, the specific directions of a job task or, or job vocabulary or lingo that these workers should know. Um, and he added that in some instances, companies actually will compensate workers for passing a certain level of the class and, and getting to a certain proficiency there. So whatever the case, though, um, Flynn and others just said that these more successful programs seem to be the ones where the employers explore that idea of opening career pathways as, again, we trend toward the more bilingual workforce. Thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing this important topic with our listeners. If you want to read more about Kevin's story or discover other news from around the safety world, please check out the April issue of Safety and Health Magazine or visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Every safety professional has a unique story. So what's yours? Safety and Health Magazine wants to hear about your unique path into the occupational health and safety field for our My Story column. Email your submissions to safehealth at nsc.org to share the road you traveled in your career journey of keeping workers safe and healthy. In fiscal year 2021, OSHA's most cited violation was fall protection general requirements for the 11th year in a row. And in construction, falls are the leading cause of death, according to OSHA, accounting for 351 fatalities in 2020. Our guest this month on Five Questions With is working to make construction workers safer and to raise hazard awareness across the country. With the National Safety Stand Down to Prevent Falls in Construction, planned for May 2nd through May 6th, we welcome Jessica Bunting, the Director of Research to Practice at CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us on the safe side. Thanks, Barry. Happy to be here. Well, Jessica, where we wanted to start with you today was our first question. Why do falls continue to be such an issue in construction? This is a great question and one that I don't have a definitive answer for. Um, you know, there are good fall prevention and fall protection solutions out there that work. 
So why are falls still the number one cause of work-related fatalities in construction? In some cases, uh, particularly in the residential sector, we sort of know that people aren't always fully aware of the dangers and how to protect themselves and their crews. So obviously there needs to be more education for some, which is really a motivating factor behind the National Fall Prevention Campaign and this annual safety stand down. But there's got to be more to it than that, right? Um, So to get a better idea, CPWR actually in 2021 partnered with um, a couple groups, including the ANSI Z359 National Work at Heights Task Force and um, the NIOSH NORA Construction Sector Council Falls Work Group. And we conducted a fall experience survey to really uh, try to identify common underlying causes of falls and how they interact with one another. And so we talked to those who have experienced, witnessed, or even investigated a fall in the field. And so we had a a number of findings from that. But just to touch on a couple of major findings, um, we found that planning by contractors and supervisors is both critical to safety and also lacking on a lot of job sites. So um, when we asked respondents to identify key factors that contributed to the fall they were reporting on, insufficient or ineffective planning was the most selected primary cause um, by about 27, uh, 27.4% of respondents. And then we also found that a lack of planning was associated with a lower likelihood of using fall protection, which is obviously a key component to protecting workers if falls do occur. Um, The odds of using fall protection were actually 71% lower for individuals whose employer or competent person did not do any planning compared to those whose employer or competent person did do the planning for fall prevention and fall protection. Um, Another thing that we found related to the use of fall protection was that um, participants who believed fall protection was required by their employer were eight times more likely to use fall protection compared to those who did not believe that it was required. So even if the fall protection was provided, if it was not required and known to be required by the workers, they oftentimes were just leaving it on the truck where we're not um, actually using it. And so obviously that's a big factor in uh, both, you know, whether a fall occurs and then what happens when the fall does occur. Uh, Jessica, you you mentioned the stand down. Uh, What are the goals of the annual event for both employers and construction workers? Yeah, well, the overall falls campaign, of which the stand down is one piece, is really year round. And the goal is just to raise awareness of fall hazards and preventative solutions among both contractors and workers, particularly those that are at the highest risk, which is small residential contractors and their workers. But in order to provide a way for participants uh, to be more actively involved in the campaign, we sort of needed something to gather our energy around. And so the annual stand down was conceived in 2014 um, by OSHA, NIOSH and CPWR. And it's meant to be an opportunity to really pause normal work activities and focus in on fall safety. So employers can take the time to have direct conversations with workers about fall hazards that they are exposed to, um, protective measures and methods that are in place or should be in place uh, to review the company's safety policies, uh, the company's goals and their expectations, and just make sure everybody is on the same page. Uh, It should also be an opportunity for workers to approach and talk to management about the fall hazards they see um, and needs that they have around fall safety. Who can participate in the stand down and how does someone get started? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, anyone can participate in the stand down. Honestly, you don't even have to be in the construction industry. There are a lot of workplaces that include work at heights or even exposure to falls on the same level. Um, You know, people deal with slips, trips and and falls in a lot of environments. And so we encourage uh, everyone who can benefit to get involved. 
We've de developed a number of resources to make it super easy. The resources are, of course, geared toward those in the construction industry um, across different types of construction, including residential, commercial, um, you know, heavy industrial construction, etc. Um, so the first step anyone should take is to visit the website stopconstructionfalls.com. This entire website is devoted to the campaign and stand down. And it includes resources from CPWR, NIOSH, OSHA, and other partners. Um, we create a stand down plan with activity ideas every year. There's a one stop stand down shop page with everything that you need to hold an event um, from all uh, of our organizations. And so, really, just going to that website will give um, anyone a ton of ideas and materials that can be adapted for their event um, and their job site. Jessica, what are some of the unique events that have occurred uh, that employers have hosted during past stand downs? You know, contractors and their workers have found a lot of ways to really make this a fun and engaging event every year. Um, some companies will participate all week long by doing smaller events like a morning tailgate meeting focused on different aspects of of falls every day or even week-long falls trivia with daily prizes. Others will hold like one big event. Um, often it's around lunchtime, so they'll provide food. Um, they'll partner with manufacturers or suppliers, uh, unions or regional and local OSHA offices, and they'll offer training and fall protection demonstrations. Um, a lot of times they'll have booths from different vendors. Um, it's also a good time to inspect equipment and personal fall arrest systems and to replace them when necessary. Some of my favorite types of activities that we've seen are actually those that involved the workers' families. Uh, so for example, one company held a poster drawing contest where employees were invited to design fall safety posters with their kids at home. And then all of the posters went up on the job site at the end of the week and the winners got a prize. So I thought that was pretty cool. For smaller companies that maybe have less time and fewer resources, we actually have a ton of pre-recorded uh, webinars and other videos on stopconstructionfalls.com. Um, so those can be uh, pulled and viewed. We have a really good one on harness fit. We have one on fall rescue, um, a bunch of different ones about how to participate in the stand down, but also other technical topics. Um, we are uh, actually holding one live during the stand down week. So so folks can participate um, as part of their stand down during that week. It's going to be on May 3rd and it's going to be a fall protection expert Q&A panel. So uh, registration for that will be available soon. And if you don't already get webinar invites from CPWR, I'd encourage you to go to our main website, cpwr.com, and sign up for our newsletter using the button near the bottom of any page on the site. What are some of the resources that are available if an employer wants to host an event? Like I mentioned earlier, um, we have a ton of resources to support companies in having a successful stand down event, all of which can be found on stopconstructionfalls.com and all of which are completely free. Um, so in addition to the stand down planning resources I touched on, we also have social media resources. We have posters and infographics. We have exposure control planning tools uh, to you know, help develop da uh, daily checklists or a complete written fall prevention plan. Um, we have ideas for keeping your fall protection program going year round. And many of those are also available in Spanish. Um, and we are actively identifying adding resources in languages other than English and Spanish right now as well. I also want to mention that CPWR prints stand down hard hat stickers and pocket size hazard alert cards every year. And so uh, we have five different hazard alert card topics, fall harnesses, ladders, scaffolds, aerial lifts, and head protection. Um, and so both the stickers and these pocket size cards are great to hand out of at events. Um, again, we will print and ship them at no cost to you. Um, and those can be ordered on stopconstructionfalls.com as well. Great. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us on this topic. Um, for folks who want to get started, stopconstructionfalls.com is the website. And it was really great to have you with us here on the safe side, Jessica. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this month's episode. We know that your time is always valuable and we're grateful that you spent some with us. 
If you'd like to share some feedback, email us at safehealth at nsc.org. We'd also appreciate you sharing a rating and review of this podcast. To find stories such as Kevin's feature on language barriers, as well as the latest news from around the occupational safety world, visit us online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Original music for this podcast was composed by Steve Masson. Thank you so much, Steve. We'll be back next month with another episode to have more safety-related discussions, talk to trusted voices from around the profession, and hopefully make you smile a little. In the meantime, we appreciate you listening via whatever platform, and feel free to spread the word about this podcast. Most of all, please stay on the safe side. <laughs>